here. She's doing this project. All right, I'm going to go ahead and get it started. Okay. Welcome to our next installation of the ESRM seminar series, Those Damn Beaches. We have a great speaker <laughs> for you today. We have Dr. Dan Reinemann here. Give you a little background on Dan. He did his undergrad at UCLA in marine biology. What, what? Right? He did <laughs> master's at the University of Hawaii in oceanography. No yeah. <laughs> 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 and his PhD at Stanford in the Environment and Resources. Is that yeah. right? Woo. Woo. Whatever that means. Whatever that, that sounds means. very interdisciplinary. Yep. Yeah. And currently he is in a postdoc position at the Bill Lane Center for the American West, which yeah. sounds really cool. So he's going to talk today about beach access in California. Welcome, Dan. Uh, thanks. <laughs> woo, woo, woo. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, sorry. No, that's okay. We can go right to that. Uh, I just want to say thanks, you guys, for uh, having me back. It's really great to be here. This is a great place. You guys are all very lucky. Um, I'm just curious. I know this class is cross-listed in ESRM and also Calm. And I was just like, show of hands, are there who's who's in who's where? I'm just curious. ESRM majors. Who, who's ESRM, the ESRM majors? Hands in the air. Who are other majors? Other, uh, not ESRM. What are you guys? I'm just curious. Calm. All communication. No. Biology. Biology. English? Okay, awesome. So that's a really cool diversity of interests. Uh, I hope to do the ESRM majors proud and <laughs> hope to not confuse anybody else and not to make the comms people frustrated with my communication skills. I don't know if this is rude to ask, but if you guys in your little pods, do you want to wheel forward? <laughs> Come on just closer. Just, like, we could cuddle up a little bit and then I don't have to. Like, <laughs> Okay, thank you. I also I have some notes. I told you I don't want to ramble and I don't want to forget things. So forgive me when I refer to my notes. Thank you for obliging me with the <laughs> bonding. Well, they really took that seriously. Uh, awesome. So, <laughs> so I want to, the, the slides are numbered. So you feel free to interrupt. You have questions, or else you can like keep track of where we are and come back to stuff at the end. Um, Okay, so I just want to start with a little bit of California history. Um, in the first half of the 20th century, it was really kind of like the golden age of surfing in California. And we're going to talk a little about surfing today. Uh, and this surf spot is called Killer Dana, and it's located right on the south side of Dana Point. Uh, and it breaks along the point of Dana Point into Dana Cove. And this is kind of, this spot was home to some of the really iconic surfers and iconic kind of like time period and moments of early history of surfing in California. And in 1966, the Army Corps of Engineers started construction of the breakwater of the Dana Point Harbor. And by the early 70s, they enclosed the breakwater, built the harbor, and completely destroyed the surf spot forever. They're like, oh, okay, well, maybe that's not such a big deal because in 1960, there, w there weren't that many surfers. There were lots of surf spots. You can oh, these guys, they can just go somewhere. Uh, but one of them said about it at the time, described the, the destruction of this spot as, as a sudden death that you couldn't talk about, the most painful thing you can imagine. It was a whole world, a whole history erased. I knew I'd never feel at home in Southern California again. So like a pretty powerful statement about like, his connection with this place. Uh, here's just another example. Uh, this is up the coast in San Mateo County. This is Martin's Beach. Um, Martin's Beach is this beautiful little pocket beach. It's about 45 minutes south of San Francisco. Uh, and for something like 100 years, people from the Bay Area have been going, taking their families to Martin's Beach. Um, and the road, the only road to get there goes through private land, it's a private road. And the owner of this beach would let the public go through his land on his road to enjoy this beach. If they wanted to park, he'd charge them for parking. But anybody could come and visit this beach. Um, so again, for generations, you have families enjoying this place. Uh, and then about five years ago, uh, Silicon Valley bazillionaire, this guy, Vinod Kosla, uh, bought the whole property, paid $32 million for this property. Uh, and pretty much shortly thereafter, he closed the gate so that no one could get to this beach anymore. Um, people would try to go, and they got arrested. And so charges were never filed. They're like, there were arrests for trespassing for people who were just trying to get back to this beach that they've been going for. Uh, and again, yeah, it's sort of the same story. People have been going there on Sundays when they're a kid. They've been going there for generations. Uh, our granddaughters learned how to smell fish with their grandfathers, celebrated birthdays, we taught surf classes. All people wanted was this path to get back to the beach. 
Um, they wanted to fish and surf and make sand castles. Um, and the community was really <clears throat> pissed about this fence. And so eventually there was a lawsuit that was brought by the Surfrider Foundation suing this guy. Um, and it went through several, several interesting processes in the court system. And in late December of 2014, the judge ruled that closing this gate was illegal because he didn't get a permit to do this. And if you're interested in why, we can talk about what he would have needed a permit for later. And, uh, and this is still ongoing. Um, so the state passed a law that said that he had to work with the state lands conservancy to figure out a way to open up this access to the beach. And so this is a, this is a big ongoing sort of debacle on the coast in northern central California. Um, in, in the, you can follow it in the news today. So what do these two stories have in common? Um, they're both stories about how access to the coast was changed. Uh, they're both stories about uh, sort of development on the coast and what does and doesn't happen there. Uh, stories about how who gets to go to certain parts of the coast has changed. And Dana Point, the surfers got replaced with boaters. So the surfers were sad, the boaters were excited. Martin's speech was more like the 1% and the 99% trading places there. Um, yeah, so both, they're also great examples of places that you saw a little bit in those quotes that were like really deeply loved by the people who went to them. Um, and those attachments to those places were disrupted by whatever the management access was. Um, and they both raised the issue of ownership, like who has the right to take away a surf spot, to create a place for boats, who has the right to close a road to a beach, right? So these are all really interesting questions and they're not actually ever easier, straightforward questions in California. Um, so what I wanna talk about today is some of these challenges that California, that other coastal societies are facing in terms of deciding what to do in these conflicts and balancing these different interests, whether it's one kind of recreation for another, whether it's conservation versus development, um, but is it the rich versus the poor? Um, so there's a couple things that, that I want you to come away with. First, I, I want you to come away with an understanding of how it's important to do this from a broader context. And so we'll talk a little bit today about what it means to think about this in terms of a coupled social ecological system um, and what about what I like to think of as coastal sustainability and how I define that. Um, I also want to make the point that this is a really interdisciplinary situation and if we're going to understand how to do this right you can't just be an ecologist you can't just be a social scientist you can't just be uh, a lawyer there's a lot of different things that all come together in the coastal zones so we'll, we'll try to make that point just by showing some different different kinds of ways of examining these kinds of questions um, there's also a few specific policies and concepts that hopefully you'll come away with knowing about one is the idea that there are really different ways uh, to understand and measure how we as humans value and derive uh, or value and connect to places. So we'll talk about place attachment. Um, and we'll talk about some specific policies, in particular uh, the public trust doctrine, which I'm on a mission to make sure that everybody knows about. <laughs> um, and we'll talk a little bit about the California Coastal Act, which is the, the law that California uses to regulate its coastal zone. So that's that's what we're gonna talk about. We're kind of just in order. I'll talk a little bit first about the sustainability thing um, on a higher level, and we'll talk a little bit about, I'm calling it who cares, but we'll talk about sort of how, wh what is that value and how do we define and measure it? Um, some of the reasons why now is a good time to start thinking about these issues of coastal sustainability. Um, then we'll close by talking about some of the ways that we balance these different things together, some of the policy mechanisms for doing that. Um, and with any luck, we'll have time to talk about it. If I, if I talk for 90 minutes, someone please throw a chair at me. <laughs> um, well before we get there. Um, so that's the plan. Sound good? Yeah. Sounds good. We, you no know, questions, like pressing questions before we dive in? <laughs> okay. Um, good, like I'm, I'm on track so far. So um, just wanna start by thinking about coastal resources. Uh, I think it's really easy for us to think about, say, a fishery or an oil field as a coastal resource. Uh, I also like to think about things like marine mammals or beaches. Like these are also coastal resources. So these are all parts of the coastal ecosystem that 
fit together in different ways and that we as humans derive benefits from, that we value for different reasons. Um, so if we want to think about how to continue to derive benefits as a society from coastal resources, we have to manage them sustainably. Uh, and that means understanding how they fit into the ecosystem, how they're valued by society. Uh, it means understanding what are the benefits that we are actually deriving from parts of these ecosystems. It means understanding what are the impacts that we're having. And uh, one of the ways we can do this is using the coupled social ecological system framework. And this is basically just a mental construct for helping us organize our thinking about these really complex systems. And so it's true we've got to think about it at the very large scale, but also at the smaller scales, uh, and right on down to the scale of, say, local species or ecosystems or individuals, because when we're actually managing these systems, this is often the, the level where management actions are targeted. Um, and so it's really important to think about how we manage these flows of benefits and impacts, right? We're not, not really managing the ecosystems themselves. We're managing the way that people are either deriving benefits or having impacts. And management in this case, it could mean government institutions, formal institutions like a law or a regulation, uh, or it could mean a cultural institution like uh, a social norm that you don't throw trash on the beach. Um, and so when I'm thinking about coastal sustainability, I'm thinking about waves, beaches, the coastal zone, and I want to make sure that, this is a co that those are coastal resources that we can derive value from both today and also in future generations. So that's kind of the broad, the broad big picture overview of where this fits in. Um, so why is it important that, that we do this? Um, I know Phil King is an economist. He's, gonna come, he's at San Francisco State. He's going to come down and talk to you guys later in the quarter. And the economists like to detect it's all about the, it's all about the dollars, <laughs> um, and so that's really important. Like the, the coastal resources are really important for the economy in California. So just give you some examples. These are different uh, sectors of the ocean economy. Uh, this is 2013 data, and so this is the, the, the number of jobs they create and the number the amount of GDP that they inject into California's economy. Um, so living resources. This is basically commercial fishing and aquaculture. Employs a couple thousand people, uh, a couple hundred million to the state's GDP every year. Uh, minerals, so this is oil drilling, natural gas extraction, sand mining, all happening right in the coastal zone and in the near shore ocean. Uh, employs almost 10,000 people, almost $10 million. The transportation is, you know, I think, the port of Los Angeles, which is the, one of the, the biggest port in the country. Um, tourism and recreation. Almost 400,000 people, $18 billion. So <coughs> tourism and recreation that is ex exclusively ocean dependent, so this doesn't include Disneyland, doesn't include visiting San Francisco. This is people who are coming to do things that can only be done right there in the coastal zone, connected to the ocean somehow. It's a huge chunk of money. Um, beaches themselves are worth up to $7 billion, and the, the range has to do with how they did this study and made their estimate. but. Just people visiting the beach to swim or surf or sit in the sun, $7 billion a year into California's GDP. Um, and just surf spots themselves, a single surf spot can inject millions of dollars just by people coming there to surf in the coastal community. So this is one way to think about the value of coastal resources. Um, what about other kinds of values? Uh, the Public Policy Institute of California did a big statewide survey this is in 2003, and they found 70% of Californians uh, feel that the, coastal, the coastline's condition is very important to the state's quality of life, that people are valuing the state for the, valuing the ocean and the coast for the state's quality of life. 90% uh, of them say the oceans and peaches are, are personally important to them. Um, so this is, you know, this is basically all of us that are included in this poll. Um, 90% of the ocean, valuing the condition of the ocean and the beaches. 70% uh, going there, and this is well above the national average for beach. So people are valuing beaches as a place that they can visit. This is another way of like, saying how we value the ocean. Um, we also value oceans and coasts culturally, right? So this is a, my favorite example is the city of Huntington Beach, which proclaims itself Surf City USA. 
Um, they care so much about this part of their identity that they went to court with the city of Santa Cruz to have the exclusive right to the title Surf City USA. Um, we know that oceans and coasts are really important to the identity of people, right? So these they define how maybe our lifestyle, how we spend our time, how we spend our money, um, what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, um, and kind of how we identify as individuals, right? There's between saying that you surf and saying that you're a surfer. So there's, a, there's an identity component that you're, you're getting some kind of value from that. Um, there are also places where we spend time with families. A lot of social interactions occur. Um, if you think of the ocean, the, especially the, the beaches, as a democratic commons, as a place where there's, there's no bar for entry. They're free and open to the public. Anyone can go. Um, so there are places that we go with, our, with families and have, have life experiences. Um, So there's also places that we fight to protect. So this is in California. This is, this is an image from Peru from just this past spring. And you can see there's a dump truck. It's dumping rocks on the beach. It's an illegal road widening project. Um, and the mayor of Lima just started doing this. And the surfers came out of the water to protest uh, and ended up fighting with the riot police in the surf to try to stop this from happening. They didn't want this happening at their beach. Uh, Here's a more local example. Um, this is uh, a protest to save trestles. So trestles is a, a beach in San Onofre State Park just down the coast. Um, and there's a proposal for a toll road to go through the watershed terminating at this beach. And uh, this is the most well-attended coastal planning meeting in the history of California. Right? So th literally thousands of people turned out because they didn't want this mm -hmm. to happen at their beach. Um, so people are doing this because these places, these, these, the coastline has like a deeper significance to them. Um, you can measure it economically, but these people aren't fighting because trestles is worth eight to $12 million a year to San Clemente's mm -hmm. GDP, right? The, the, the economic value is a byproduct of something more fundamental. Um, and so we did some work to try to understand what drives this in California, and so to set up, just also to tell you a little bit about the study that we did, and to set that up, uh, I'll just tell you a little bit about some of the theory that we used to inform this. Um, and so about the importance of place. And so there is a body of research on what we could call place theory, and this has centered really on this idea that like we as, as humans, as social animals, there's a difference between abstract space and meaningful place in terms of the way that we like interact with the physical world around us. Um, so this has now been studied in, started, started by geographers in the 70s and it's now studied by sociologists and psychologists. It's used in forestry and architecture and planning. And the whole idea is to understand what it is about the places around us that makes them important for us as a species. Um, and so we talk specifically about this idea of place attachment, which we define as the bonding of people to places. And it, and it like sounds like this wonky thing, but as we saw in those pictures of people fighting and protesting, this is something that actually motivates people's behavior. Um, so place attachment is positively correlated with things like pro-environmental pro and place protective behaviors. It motivates people to participate in planning. Um, the effectiveness of natural resource policies can be linked to people's attachments to those places. So this question for us was, you know, our beaches, there's a lot of beaches, some beaches look sort of like other beaches. The idea we want to understand, like, are, are beaches simply these interchangeable recreational spaces or do they have value as coastal places? And maybe that's what underlies some of the reasons people go and fight for these kinds of places. Um, so we did a survey of roughly 1,000 Californians because place attachment can be measured quantitatively. So first I'll give you some of the ways we measured it quantitatively, and then I'll talk about some of the qualitative results. Um, and what we found in this survey was that uh, focusing specifically on, in this case, on, on surf spots as coastal resources, that there was a positive correlation between higher, surf attach higher attachment to surf spots, um, and better surfers, people that were more, felt more knowledgeable about those places, that went there more often, and also that were in more rural parts of the coast. 
And so you can, this is something that we can measure, and we can measure the extent to which people connect with these places. Um, we also found that different kinds of surf spots have different kinds of place attachments. So you think of reef breaks and point breaks as more discrete locations on the coast, and they have a higher, associated with a higher place attachment than beach breaks, which often sp spread out along long stretches of beaches. Is that point break Malibu? That is indeed. Yeah. And then Wind and Sea, and that's Ocean Beach, San Francisco. Um, so it's really interesting. This suggests that the physical environment itself shapes the way people attach to it. So we can also measure this qualitatively. Um, and we can also use the qualitative data to understand sort of some of the things that are underlying those attachments. Um, so for example, some of our respondents said things like, it's my home and in my family and local history. It's part of my being a native. So they're associating this coastal place uh, with their home, with their family, uh, with their identity as a, as a native of coastal California. Uh, I've served this spot my whole life and I grew up here. I spread my grandmother's ashes here. So they're, they're describing like, like growth and life and death and ritual. Um, our community is amazing. I love paddling out and being surrounded by friends. And so it's not just the physical environment, but it's the social environment of places that makes them important to us. There are places where we can go and find friends and family, find or create. Uh, and when we question them, well, how would you feel if you were to lose these places? They said some really powerful things. So it'd be like losing a home. Um, or I'd be devastated to feel like I was, my father is being taken away from me again. So this kind of resonates in the same way that we saw at Dana Point in the very beginning, talking about having a whole history of race. So people connect really powerfully with the coast. And so this, I just want you to, like, the takeaway from this is there's, there are ways that we value places around us, and it's those types of attachments to places that really drive a lot of the other kinds of values, like economic value, that we can go and measure. Uh, so why is now a good time to start thinking and caring, and not just measuring that, but putting it into this larger picture? Uh, so I won't, I won't belabor <coughs> all of the, the things that threaten the coast. I'm sure that you guys are, are more than aware of most of them. Climate change and sea level rise, uh, increased frequency of, and strong increased frequency and intensity of storms, more coastal erosion. Those are all kind of on the, the natural side, even if humans are part of the root cause. Um, but we do other things too, like the Refugio oil spill that just happened right up, right up the road from you guys. For, first on the scene, go team. Um, <laughs> but also there's, our, there's political forces at work that threaten the way that we use and access and manage these places. And so you might have seen this in the news in February that uh, the California Coastal Commission fired its executive director. And this has never happened before in the roughly 50 year history of the agency. Um, and this has implications for the way that coastal management is going to happen in California. Um, sea level rise, I, I, from the, a coastal, from a beach sustainability perspective, is really significant. It's not just all of the, the buildings and property and roads that are more or less at sea level, um, but the beaches, pretty much by definition, um, are at sea level. And so. The 0.5 to 1.5 meters of sea level that's sea level rise is projected by the end of the century. It's going to make potentially make a lot of beaches a lot thinner. So you can think of this as kind of the ocean encroaching up onto the coast. Um, but the people we're we're like encroaching from the other way. So this is this is population in California, um, and for the last hundred years and projected out to the, the middle of this century. Um, it's the, the, the graph is split because you can look, the scales are usually different, and that's just because LA is, has <laughs> so many people. Um, but as of right now, where we are, 20, 20 60, 60, I know. 60, where the yeah, blue no. line is, uh, so this is just California's 15 coastal Pacific Coast counties. Um, currently, one out of every 15 Americans lives in one of these 15 counties, which is pretty crazy. Um, and I, I, the thing that has blew my mind is Ventura is yeah. on its way to the fastest growth for the next 25 years. And that's crazy. Th that's, that's, that's pretty crazy. Um, so like one way to read that is like big change is going to happen. You know, all those people are going to mm -hmm. need places to live and they're going to need jobs mm -hmm. and work. And so that's, it's going to change. It's, what is that, a 20% increase? Yeah, and it's, SOAR is up, our, our, our land management uh, uh, 
governing um, policy is in the unincorporated parts of the county is up for renewal yeah. this year. So, so that will result in, in changes in Ventura, and these are going to encroach onto the coast also. Right? So it's not just it's not that I don't make that people aren't the threat to the coast, right? Um, but it's the things that we do to protect the things that we build. Um, so this is just down the road in, in Malibu. And so if you add sea level rise to this fairly recent picture, right, there's not a lot of place for Cal the rest of Californians to go to the beach. When is this one? When was that taken? Um, oh, that is a good question. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's Broad Beach, right? It, no, this is not Broad Beach. Um, this is a Malibu colony, so like Malibu Point Oh, really? It's just oh, wow. maybe a quarter mile down. Um, I mean, it could have been this winter, but it wasn't. It was probably last winter. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think they've done any big Not there. armoring or nourishment there since. Not there, yeah. I tried to find a good picture of Broad Beach just because it's in the news, but mm -hmm. anyway. This is just down the road. Uh, we also, so this is, gonna, this is clearly going to affect the accessibility of beaches. Um, if you can get through the line of houses to the sand or to the water line, you're not going to find any sand there. Um, we also did a study to see how this might affect surf spots as a coastal resource. Um, this is just a quick plot of the results. The size of the circles is how many surf spots in each county we evaluated. Uh, Red surf spots are endangered, which is we think that they'll disappear by the end of the century. Yellow ones are threatened. Um, so they could disappear, but they might also adapt. So you can see Ventura there, something like two thirds of the surf spots that we evaluated in Ventura are likely to disappear, maybe not, by the end of the century. Um, Santa Barbara, roughly one third endangered, could disappear. San Luis Obispo is in even better shape. Um, so it's not just the beaches, there's other parts of this coastal system that are going to change going forward. Um, quick yeah. Last one. Why is San Luis Obispo getting better? Uh, so the way that this model, so basically they have a lot of really, they have a lot of surf spots there that break best when tide is really high. Oh, so okay. as sea level rises, mm -hmm. it'll yeah. shift the window of best conditions towards the, the current. But yeah, go ahead. So it seems like, well, considering that, it seems mm -hmm. like the beaches that are mostly sandy or the the counties that are on average mostly sandy are going to be affected the most. And like San Luis Obispo County, to my knowledge, is relatively rocky on the coastline, right? Yeah, and it's also uh, the way that these data are collected is it's by a surf spot. Uh -huh. um, okay. So this, it's like aggregated by a surf spot, okay. not by like not the whole length of the coast. Okay. No, I, I, but I want to do that with, with Kiki. Right. Mm -hmm. cool. um, as I think that'd be a really neat way to do it also. Cool. Yeah. Good question. Um, so this, this has implications for how we manage the coastline, right? So if you think of your sort of natural coastal profile, you have surf spots, you have beaches, their location is basically defined by physical coastal processes um, that have been going on for quite some time. Uh, as sea level rises, so as natural coastal processes shift sediments, erosion, there's transport, there's deposition. So as sea level rises in a natural system, things just will migrate. And we know that that happens because 18,000 years ago, sea level was 140 meters below where it is now. And as it's come in, we still have beaches and surf spots. And they definitely are different than they were, but we, we still have them. Uh, the problem is now when we add humans into the mix and we add things that we need to protect, we might make a decision to build a seawall, lay down some riprap to protect roads or infrastructure. Uh, and in this case, those processes get interrupted, <coughs> and those resources may disappear. Um, and this is definitely not a hypothetical situation. Uh, there's something like $100 billion worth of coastal property and infrastructure that is threatened by sea level rise. Uh, there are more than 100 miles of seawalls in California already. Um, and there's millions of residents, and there's also millions of tourists who come for the beaches. There's important ecosystems. There's endangered species. There's activities that people like to go and enjoy. There's towns that derive their whole identity based on kind of the amenities that are the resources that are happening in this space. 
Um, so it makes it really complicated, the situation, right? So it's complicated economically, it's complicated demographically, it's complicated socially, um, it's complicated ecologically, it's complicated legally. It's, it's like a huge pickle. Uh, so, oh, we're making such good time. It's because I forgot to say all that other important stuff really. <laughs> um, so what I want to talk about just kind of in these last few minutes is some of the ways that we deal with this pickle and some of kind of the policy levers that can swing uh, both ways that play into how we do this balancing. And then I think there's going to be lots of time to talk about it. Um, so as I've been describing, there's these physical processes that in, in a very real way are going to force coastal communities and force us as a coastal society to make a choice between whether we're going to protect property and infrastructure or some of these coastal resources that we've been talking about. Um, and so if it's the beaches and the access to them that you value, like it would seem that the law is on your side. So this is the California Constitution, which says that no one should be permitted to exclude the right of way to our coastal coast and waters. Um, access to these waters shall always be attainable to the people thereof. So that's like great, the Constitution is on your side. This is access to the beach, is in the Constitution in California, which I think is. <laughs> um, uh, and it actually makes sense because the, the language in the Constitution is a codification of a common law legal doctrine called the Public Trust Doctrine, which actually dates back to Roman times. Um, we could do a whole lecture just on this, I think. Um, but the Public Trust Doctrine basically says that the tide lands and submerged lands belong to the people of California and the state holds them in trust and manages them for our benefit or more succinctly, we the public own the beaches and the state has to take care of them for us. Um, and this is, this is so important that I, I wanna say it again. This, this public, we, you and I in California, we own the beaches, we own the tidelands and the state's role is to take care of them and manage them for our benefit. Uh, so if you remember nothing else, <laughs> uh, I'm on a mission to make sure that everybody knows about the public trust doctrine. Uh, the, the beaches, they're your beaches. Okay, sorry. Um, so you figure the public trust doctrine plus the constitution um, plus a host of other laws seem like they shift this balance in favor of managing the coast to protect the waves, the beaches, the things that we can get out on the coast and enjoy. Um, but there's another law, this is the California Coastal Act, and by and large, the Coastal Act does a lot of really great things. But it does have this one tricky little section which says that seawalls and other armoring that alter the natural shoreline shall be permitted when required to protect existing structures. And this shall is so not trivial. This means that the state agency doesn't have a choice. If it's a, if it's a structure that needs to be protected and they want to build a seawall to protect it, the state can't say, ah, you, you, you can't do that. You're going to make the beach go away. They, they have to permit it. Um, so this is a really interesting situation, and it's a little problematic. And you might think, oh, maybe it's like shifting the balance back towards protecting property and infrastructure and sacrificing the beaches. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, going back to the last slide, when it, um, like you said, when it says a shoreline process shall be permitted, is that also, is that related to um, the gentleman who bought out uh, well, Martin Speech? Martin Speech, is that what he basically had also? No, so it's a really that, good, is that like a different? it's a different part of the same law. Okay. Um, and promise me you'll ask that again. Okay. When, when I'm done, when I, when I finish this, because it's a different part of the law and we'll totally come back to it because it's a really interesting, the, the, the ruling against him hinged on this one little, same with the way that like this shall is important in this part of the law. Mm -hmm. The ruling against him that said he had to reopen the beach hinged on basically on just like, this tiny little thing. So, so kind of like a branch off of this. Uh, it's a, a different section. But ask me again, we'll come back okay, to the okay. prompt. <laughs> okay. Um, so that section of the act which suggested, oh no, like we have to permit all these things that are built on the coast. And so those coastal resources that you and I like to go and enjoy, they're in a pickle. Um, 
But it turns out that this law also provides some guidance on how we actually do balance between those two things. And so this is the section, it's called the conflict busting section. It says that these conflicts be resolved in a manner which on balance is the most protective <laughs> of significant coastal resources. Um, I, want, I want to say this right. Uh, so I guess what, what, so what, what the takeaway from this is if, if we want to actually achieve this balance, then there's actually a lot of things that we need to understand about this system, right? So we need to understand what resources are significant and why and to whom. Um, we need to understand how, what exactly the conflicts are and how they are going to affect those different resources differently. Um, and so when I, when I think about, you know, Kiki said, I, oh, I study environment and resources. And what the hell does that mean? Like, this, this is kind of the way, one of the ways it helps me think about what it is that I do is think about all these things together in such a way that we can actually achieve this balance that we can get ourselves towards sustainably managed coastlines. Um, and so I'll just next, I'll, one of the other parts of this we need to understand is how this process plays out. And so I'm, I'll just tell you briefly about some of the work that we're starting to pivot to do now at the center is trying to understand how this balancing process, how, once you have the information that you need, how do we actually do this balancing process um, in California? So we've got a data set of coastal permits and we're trying to, we're spinning up some projects to look at, for example, differences in how we do emergency permits versus sort of regular order permits. And if the differences in that permitting process affect the outcomes on the coast. Um, looking at the pr planning priorities of different coastal communities to see if the way that different towns place value as, as communities through their laws on different coastal resources affect what happens to those resources. Um, and this is something that I'm really interested in doing is looking at the implications of this from a social environmental justice standpoint, right? Like, are some groups of people going to systematically be prevented from accessing the coast based on permitting decisions to say, let a rich guy protect his house. Maybe that's, I mean, that's a little loaded, maybe I shouldn't quite go there, but that's, that's gonna be a big problem, as you've seen in Malibu. Um, we are also looking at the Coastal Commission itself, because this firing has really shaken things up in terms of the way that we think about this process, um, the way the forces of sort of development and conservation are balanced in California, and which are the parties that are coming to dig into that process. So the political economy, this, the power balance between local governments and state government in terms of what gets permitted and why. Um, and so these are really interesting factors that shape the way that you and I are able to use and enjoy and access the coast in California for the next decades. Um, so. So I'm going to just wrap this up, and then we can talk about this stuff, and we'll go back to your question. Uh, so when I think about coastal sustainability and like what that actually means, uh, it means really understanding this from a big picture, thinking about what's happening to the resources, what's happening to the people who value them, understanding how all those things fit together, um, kind of what are the kinds of values that we derive that motivate our behaviors towards these places, um, both as individuals and communities. That means understanding the threats to this system um, and what that means for the different resources that we care about. Uh, and it means understanding how society is going to go ahead and balance between m when making these really challenging decisions. Um, so that's that. And I guess if we can nail all those things, then Maybe things will be more sustainable for the coastal resources that we care about. Uh, maybe things will work out differently for different people, but these are all issues that will affect the way that we as Californians get to access and use this resource. And since you own it, I encourage you to pay attention. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what I have. So thank you for letting me get through that. And now let's, we can we talk about it. So that's all. Great.